In Nova Scotia's Annapolis Valley, an entire backwoods clan is tried and convicted of incest. They're sent to jail. The children are taken away. The cost, millions of dollars and a broken family. I'm Joan Melanson. Tonight, a special documentary prepared by CBC News reporter Claude Vickery. He's followed this story since it first broke two years ago. Here's his report on the Goalers, the untold story. This man is 57 years old. He's poor. He can't read much more than a comic book. Borderline retarded. That's what a psychologist says. He spent the last four months in jail, and he still doesn't know why. Well, I realized a little bit, but I don't know if it's anything, uh, I don't know too much to learn, because I didn't do anything to learn it. <laughs> I just go day, live day by day like I always did. That's all I done. I never done anything wrong, do you think? This going to make any change in your life, having gone to prison? Well, I, uh, I remembered and all that what I done, but I don't know to go or can't learn much more than you learned because I, I didn't do anything wrong by. <laughs> in jail, they called him a pervert. That's because he's one of the Gullers, the family clan from the South Mountain that was jailed for sexually abusing their children. Inside the house, the matriarch of the Goler clan, Stella Goler, reads a letter from her son. He's still in prison, 2,000 miles away. Dear Mom and Dad, just a few lines to see how you all are. I am okay, Mom. Just hurt so much of the way them kids lied on us and put us all away. Mom, I miss you and Dad and our little church and all of our friends back home. I wish this mess was over and we were all home again as one happy family. Mom. What did the RCMP do to this family? He broke my family all to pieces. Them cops did. And new minor. He come here and got them bullies. And it wasn't good. In the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia, the name Goler has become synonymous with inbreeding, incest, poverty, and ignorance. Fifteen members of this backwoods clan have been put in jail for sexually abusing their children. The children have all been taken from their parents and put in foster homes. Tonight on Inquiry, we'll look at the Goler family and the heavy price they had to pay for doing something that's been a way of life around here for generations. Every spring, the Apple Blossom Festival is celebrated throughout the Annapolis Valley. But on the other side of the mountain, there isn't much to celebrate, the South Mountain of the Annapolis Valley. For the people who live in these rundown shacks, it's a life of poverty, unemployment, and welfare. These houses are just a few minutes away from the town, but it's a world apart. When the Goalers came here 40 years ago, there was lots of work, seasonal work on the valley farms or cutting wood for the local mill. The work ran out, but the family stayed. Charlie Goaler built the house. His sons never moved away. It was a life of boredom and futility. The family spent a lot of time just standing around the kitchen, passing the time of day. The family survived on the old age checks of the parents. It was a big family where the kinfolks were always coming and going. And the family took care of its own. The mother, Stella, ruled the family. Cecil Goler was paralyzed from the neck down. He had to be cared for in a house that had no running water, no bath, and no toilet. Cecil's youngest brother, Cranswick Goler. Well, we're just ordinary people like the rest of them, and uh, we're just trying to make a living in an honest way, not stealing nothing, not all kinds of stuff, you know. We don't steal, and just try to do an honest living like the rest of them. I suppose that I will come. The boys didn't get much schooling, grade three, grade four. 
hillbillies. That's what the people in town said about the Golers. Some people treated the family like dirt. In all, there were eight Goler children, four boys, four girls, growing up in the 1940s. It was so crowded that the children often shared mattresses on the floor. The next generation grew up in the same kind of poverty. The girls married young to local boys. Sixteen years ago, Roy Hiltz married Mary Goler. They had two children, got divorced. Later, he married Mary's sister, Stella Goler. This is Hazel Pinch. Her brother married a Goler. Her father married a Goler. And she, too, married a Goler, Willie Goler, who lived next door to his parents. We never borrowed nobody. They never borrowed us. So, you know, it's just more or less we kept to ourselves. The Goler's isolation ended abruptly two years ago. A 14-year-old girl ran away from the family, and she wasn't going to come back. She told the authorities that her father was treating her like a wife, having sex with her 10 to 15 times a month, and telling her that she was going to have his baby. Well, this set into motion a chain of events that no one could have foreseen. The RCMP came and took away all of the children for questioning. Before long, the secret was out. Now the Golers would come face to face with a justice system that they just didn't understand. The Golers were rounded up and put in jail for the night. Early news reports described them as a hillbilly sex ring. No one had ever seen anything quite like them. Inside the courtroom, it was standing room only. No one wanted to miss the show. Wanda Whiston, in the brown jacket, was a star attraction. She was living common law with one of the Golers and was accused of sexually abusing four boys and four girls. It was a case without precedent in Canada. 13 people, 137 charges of sexual assault, incest, gross indecency, buggery, having sex with a girl under 14. One of the Crown prosecutors said it was just like something out of the movie Deliverance. Later, two more women would be charged, bringing the total number of defendants to 15. The cases would eventually involve a dozen defense lawyers, most paid for by legal aid. But the lawyers couldn't help the family much because most of the Golers had already made incriminating statements to the RCMP. All the legal aid lawyers could do was to plead the Golers not guilty and arrange for bail. Tom Goler describes that first day. Well, I don't know, but I didn't mind too much. But it got on my nerves a little bit. All was looking at me and stuff like that. And I ain't uh, used to people looking at me all the time like that, a bunch of them like that. Was it confusing, all these different lawyers? Well, a little bit. When uh, one fuck lawyer came up to me, and he, then I see another one, and then I see another one. I, I said to my son, I said, what are they doing all in here? So then I realized it's all different cases. But I don't know. It's, I just didn't like it. I, nothing I could do about it. Bob Levy was one of the defense lawyers. If one were to, to make a blanket statement, one would have to say yes. They were uh, they're just totally on another planet, totally, uh, totally uh, unable to have the slightest idea in the world what was happening to them in the court process. They could define it in terms of uh, they're charged with something, um, but in terms of being able to appreciate any of the, uh, uh, the more basic things of what was happening to them, uh, I'd have to say that their level of appreciation was, was very, very low indeed. The Golers were released on $500 bail and ordered by the court not to have any contact with their children, a dozen children ranging in age from 6 to 14. The children were taken away for good. It was just a, an ongoing, uh, terrible situation for the children. Garth Gordon was a lawyer for the Children's Aid Society. He says that the Golers did know the difference between right and wrong. The, the information that has come out is that in some cases the, the offenders posted my children as lookouts to uh, keep guard while they were performing the, the offenses. Uh, and other, other information that came out indicated that children were, were threatened and beaten in some cases uh, to remain quiet. 
uh, and in other uh, situations, it became apparent from the children that they were offered gifts if they remained silent. For months after the charges were laid, the Goler case was the talk of the town. Uh, I would say there's something they were brought up with that's been down from generation to generation, and they, they think they didn't, they didn't do anything wrong. Oh, they may have known it was wrong, but they done it so high. Nobody ever told them different. It's an awful thing, and I don't condone it at all. I think those people should be all given everything the law can pass out to them. It's gross. <laughs> well, I mean, those kids, it's, it's terrible. I mean, those kids don't, didn't even know what was happening to them, really, and it's a shame. It shouldn't be happening. If they're found guilty, do you think they should go to jail, the goalers? I think so. I mean, they say some of them aren't even in their right mind anyways, but if they're guilty, they should go. However, there were many people in the Annapolis Valley who felt that the goalers had been punished enough by losing their children. Now, they needed help. They shouldn't go that hard on them. They shouldn't send some welfare workers in there maybe to straighten things out. But as far as putting them in jail, that's kind of crazy because they've been doing it for years. They just need to be straightened out on them. I don't know. Jail just not the place for them. I think they should be sent into an institution somewhere where they get, you know, more help. Lawrence Kelly was one of the people charged in the Goler case. His brother was married to one of the Golers, and Kelly was accused of having sex with a 12-year-old girl. Like most of the Goler clan, Kelly had never been in trouble with the law before. He has a grade three education, can't read or write very much. And he's lived in this one-room shack ever since he was born, 52 years ago. Kelly lives alone. His only company is an AM radio. Need him a dinner. What you got for dinner? Some bread and tea. Kelly can't afford luxuries like indoor plumbing because he's on welfare for most of the year. He never complained. He kept to himself. A local housing official says it's this kind of grinding poverty that's the root cause of incest. Cameron Jess. In, the, in this particular case, much of the um, incest and the related sexual abuse of children that we're seeing is no question related to literally generations of um, living in acute poverty with no privacy, no sense of involvement in the community as a whole. When you say no privacy, what do you mean? Well, I mean like uh, maybe uh, uh, two adults, three or four children sharing one bed. Uh, that kind of situation. Often sharing one bed because that's the only way of keeping warm. Um, it, it, uh, it is not hard to envisage how these things can happen when people live under those conditions and become so despairing of improving their lot and so cut off from the community as a whole that they literally uh, uh, have no longer have any set of values which protect them, shall we say, from that kind of behavior. In recent years, upwards of 20 people have been living at the Goler homestead. Aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, brothers and sisters. Marjorie Goler. You know what incest means? I know what it means. I'm old enough to know. There ain't been none of that going on that I could see. And I don't know why they try to make a great big scene of it anyway. They just got a child went and told lies that they're leading it all around now to every child. As far as I'm concerned, the people in town or anywhere else probably done just as bad, if not worse. I don't know how this started. I still don't know how it started. It, one kid started it all. And I bet right now, she's sorry she ever started it. Do you know what the word incest means? Insects? Incest. No. Do you know that it's wrong having sex with, with children, with young people? Well, sure it's wrong. It's wrong. And if a man had any guts way, he wouldn't ever do it. One judge said, that most, if not all, of the defendants had been sexually abused when they were children. The victims, he said, grew up to be offenders. A sociologist from Acadia University looked into the family and found the pattern of incest going back for generations. Jim Sackerman. There are census materials available that make it very clear that inbreeding uh, and incest were occurring in the 1860s and 1870s. In the Goler family. family. Within the Goler family. 
If the goalers had been prepared to tell all, it might have gained them the sympathy of the court. But the goalers could not or would not admit their guilt. The defense hoped that the results of IQ testing would help the case. Lawyer Bob Levy. The testing that we had done uh, would indicate that they're borderline retarded. Um, as a general rule, some more so than others, or, but basically that as a class, as a group, they were borderline retarded, operating in the bottom one or two percent of the population in, in most of the areas tested, all or most of the areas tested. Uh, um, next to no formal education, grade two, grade three, grade four or five uh, at tops, um, and uh, next to uh, no ability to read, um, very little to, to no understanding of what the court process was about, what the criminal process was about. But as that court process dragged on, the goalers had to endure the insults of the community, the wisecracks, the dirty jokes, the obscene phone calls, people driving by shouting insults. We've been getting all kinds of dirty names called by here at night, and a bunch of foolishness, I guess I would call it. What are they shouting out? Well, they call them all kinds of dirty names, like perverts, and well, different kinds of dirty names which I won't repeat. And I don't think it's known any of it, really, but we're not convicted yet. It was convicted and all that kind of stuff, I would say it'd be a different story. But uh, I can't apparently say we ain't no need of it yet. The defense hoped that the court would put the goalers on probation with some sort of compulsory psychiatric counseling. The defense said there was no reason to put the goalers in jail because they were no threat to society or to their children. By this time, the children had been taken away for good. However, the Crown prosecutor insisted on heavy jail terms. The, the Crown's reaction, I say with the greatest respect, was... Uh, wanting a pound of flesh. If they, uh, if they know I offend, they cast it out. They wanted to cast them out. They didn't want to deal with the fact uh, that these people uh, were human beings, uh, with uh, the fact that they would someday be returning to society. Um, I think they wanted revenge. Through it all, the goalers never showed any remorse. And the Crown prosecutor said that the goalers could not benefit from psychiatric treatment because they would not admit that they had a problem. To make matters worse, the goalers tried to take back the statements they had made to the RCMP on the day they were arrested. Roy Hills. When they started questioning me, they had me nervous up so bad, my, my head felt like that big. And I, I didn't know what I was talking about. And uh, I, told them, I, told them the story, I told them the true story first, and they wouldn't believe it. They wouldn't believe nothing. They called me a uh, pure bad liar, and they, they said I should have been castrated, and all this stuff. Well, I, my nerves won't take that stuff. And, and, and that's why I told them that lie. I told him. You admitted to it? I admitted it, yeah. But you say now that's a lie? That's a lie. St. Clair Jodry was accused of having sex with a 12-year-old girl. This is the closest he ever came to admitting it. I don't know what time I think. How, how can you do, uh, think when she comes on to you? There ain't much you can do, Eddie. Somebody comes on to you. Ain't much a person can do. After a while, after a while, you gotta give up or do something. In the midst of all the denials, some of the goalers took up a sudden interest in religion, and Willie Goler, who had never let his children go to Sunday school, was now talking like a born again Christian. Willie, uh, the prosecution has suggested that this whole interest in religion and whatnot—that it's some kind of a con game. What do you? How do you respond to that? Jesus is not a con. It's not a con game. Jesus is our savior. Jesus is up above. I got baptized to believe in the Lord and to believe in this holy book. It's not a con game. There's a whole bunch of baptized and they believe in the Lord. For the first time in their lives, some of the goalers were going to evening Bible study. On Sundays, they went to Sunday school. Some people in the local church were suspicious. But others felt it was the goalers' way of finally showing their remorse. At the same time, a local preacher, David Long, was coming to the house to pray for Cecil Goler, the crippled brother. Dear Lord Jesus, we would ask that you would come into this house this day, Lord, and be with Cecil, that you would lift him up, heal these crippled limbs, and Lord, make him walk, make him talk. Lord, we know that he loves you, and we would ask that you would 
just speak to him in a very special way. Lord, we just know that we ask this in your name. Amen. How do you think the community has treated this family here? Well, as I see it, they've more or less uh, been sort of left out, left to themselves. And uh, I think that it was a mistake. Why is that? Well, I think if they had been uh, welcomed in, if they had been uh, invited to activities, uh, both in the church and otherwise, that uh, perhaps this whole thing may not have happened. It might have influenced their life, that uh, there might have been a change. Now, most of the family members are going to Bible study and going to church. Have you noticed much of a change in their behavior? Oh, certainly so. You can just see it as their faces light up and uh, their li lives have been changing. They've been uh, slicking up around their place. They've been uh, bathing every day. They've been, uh, oh, there's a complete change in them. But for Judge Hall and the other judges, it didn't make much difference. Willie Goler, seven years in jail for buggery, gross indecency, incest. Willie's common-law wife, Wanda Whiston, four years for sexually assaulting eight children. Cranswick Goler, six years, nine months, buggery with a 12-year-old male cousin. Cranswick's sister Josie, six months for sexual assault. Her conviction is under appeal. Josie's former boyfriend, Earl Johnstone, six months for performing oral sex on a young boy. Josie's sister Mary, one year in jail for sexual assault. Her conviction is under appeal. Mary's husband, Lawrence Johnstone, two and a half years for buggery with a niece. Willie's brother, Tom Goler, three years, buggery with a nephew and niece. Tom's former brother-in-law, Roy Hiltz, one year, buggery with a seven-year-old girl. Willie's former brother-in-law, Eugene Brown, two and a half years for sexually abusing his niece and nephew. Willie's former brother-in-law, Ralph Kelly, three years, buggery with a seven-year-old girl. Kelly's brother, Lawrence, one year, having sex with a 12-year-old girl. St. Clair Jodry, one year in jail, also for having sex with a 12-year-old girl. Charlie Goler, Jr., two years, having sex with a female cousin under 14. Billy Goler got three years, despite evidence that he had been the victim of sexual abuse as a child. The judge said he, of all people, should have known better. The old family homestead is deserted now, and society is still adding up the bill. The legal aid fees, the police overtime, the cost of foster care for the children, the cost of keeping the goalers in jail. The bill could exceed five million dollars. As for the children, well, one judge predicted that the children would never recover from the trauma after being sexually abused for all those years. However, that doesn't seem to be the case. Right from the beginning, the children got excellent psychiatric counseling, and it seems to be working. Family and Children's Services says that the children are making an excellent recovery. Five of the children have been adopted by families here in the Annapolis Valley. Five of the children are in foster homes. However, the two oldest children, both teenagers, have had a lot of trouble in their foster homes, and in time, they may end up back here. However, for the most part, the children seem to have a much better life. They've gone from a life of poverty to a life of relative affluence, a middle-class life. Now they have a future. However, it's a different story for the adults. Eight of the Goalers are still in the Kingston Penitentiary in protective custody. By and large, they are not getting any psychiatric help. They are described as model prisoners, but they probably won't get early parole because they still won't admit their guilt. Five of the Goalers are out of jail now. They're drifting back to the South Mountain to try and pick up the pieces. But their lives will never be the same again. Cecil, do you like your new home? The government built a new home for Stella, her husband, and Cecil. And for the first time in their lives, they have a house that's warm in the wintertime. It may be 1989 before the last of her three sons is back home again. If these people have any more children, the authorities will probably take them. Children's Aid will be keeping a close eye on the goalers. As far as society is concerned, the case is closed. The goalers have paid a heavy price, and they'll go on paying 